Hi. So that's my first time standing in front of such a, a big crowd. So mandatory selfie, please. Hands, 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 come on. All right. So let's talk about micro front ends, but uh, from a different kind of angle this time. All right, so it's been uh, established in the past, I don't know, three years that micro front ends is a hot trend. Uh, you could read about it everywhere. You can go to conferences and get at least one talk about it. Uh, in this conference, for example, we have this one and the one following me. And uh, a lot of developers really uh, start to release uh, their uh, implementations for this type of solution. Uh, so in general, it feels a bit like a silver bullet to that big app problem that we're experiencing since we start to develop this single page app that live in the browser. I want to focus today my talk about uh, the dark side of uh, having micro front ends inside your development flow. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work for two different companies in the past five years uh, that implemented this type of solution in the front end layer. And if I can teach you or tell you only one lesson, that it's not really all uh, unicorns and rainbows. Uh, the advantages are pretty clear, and I'm going to elaborate about them a bit later. But what about the complexities you'll be now adding to the way you develop software? As developers, usually we really um, uh, tend to be drawn to the implementation side of things. Uh, we check the tech stack and how it's going to integrate with our code base. Uh, we ask yourself, am I going to nail a better job next time I'm going to look for? Uh, because I did that, this type of solution. But while the implementation you will choose matters, is it the only thing that matters? So hi, my name is Liron, and I'm a front-end architect at AppsFlyer. <laughs> AppsFlyer is a mobile analytics and attribution uh, platform, and we basically help app developers uh, just to understand better how their marketing money is being spent. We started to operate in 2012 as a two-man show, and we grew rapidly since. Just for example, in the past uh, three years, we grew our uh, dev team from 20 people to 200 people. So that's rapid growth. And as you know the drill, you have more developers. Product managers want to deliver more features and more uh, products. So this means that your code base is getting grow, uh, growing bigger and bigger. And this imposes a lot of risk. Uh, and as heavily experienced with microservices for the backend side, we thought that micro front end will be a very natural path for us to take for the front end layer as well. Now, me personally, I'm very experienced with rapid scale. I scaled my own family from one girl to a full house of girls in just one shot. So I was feeling pretty confident I'm going to nail that here as well. So just in case uh, you've been living in a cave for the past three years and you really don't know what I'm talking about and micro front ends and microservices and how it all comes together, let's just cover the basics. In a nutshell, microservices is all about breaking your code base into uh, a small, isolated, and independent units uh, that really commits just to the API layer that they expose. Uh, you need to make sure that you have minimum dependencies between them. And if you get it right, you'll get more reliable and faster release cycle, and you'll get better uh, more happy developers and more happy customers. Micro frontends heavily relies on the same concept, just with one small distinction. In this case, the user can actually see how it all comes together in his browser. Now, while a backend developer really can just make sure that the API layer he's exposing uh, is not breaking and not changing, for the front-end developer, this task is a lot harder because you will be forced to use some kind of a shared component library, maybe to manage some global application state that combines all of this mess together. And sometimes even you will need to make hard decisions about the tech stack that you use just because all of these pieces need to get along together in the browser. Today, the industry forced us to deliver fast in a, in a reliable way. So having multiple teams working on the same code base is very hard task to accomplish. Uh, at some point, you will need to embrace this kind of concept into your workflow. Uh, and when you do, I'm sure you're going to search the internet for all the type of solutions out there. You're going to read about stuff. You're going to read about uh, the implementations available, about the tech stack that you will need to integrate. But 
while the implementation uh, is important, I can guarantee you're going to impose some side effects into your organization in the way you weren't planning for. See what I did there? OK. So let's, be, uh, let's break them down one by one. And that's the main focus of that talk. So the first side effect is that eventually you're going to have some uh, part of a shared code in your system. Now, while it is considered to be a good thing for most parts, uh, it's really hard to nail it uh, right uh, for the first time if you don't have experience with that before. You will need to nail the right amount of abstraction you take away from your developer. You will need to test it thoroughly uh, via unit test, integration test, and even visual regression test if it's a component library, for example. Uh, you will need to add a lot of documentation, so this way developers can use your utilities and service in a self-serve manner. Uh, and since you're doing it at the first time, like I said, you're probably not going to get it right uh, from the beginning. Let's just see an example and how costly it is to an organization kind of layer. What we can see here is uh, a simple drop-down component on the left side. We can see here that the component supports single select options. And now a product manager comes along. And obviously, he wanted already yesterday that you will implement a multi-select option. Now, let me ask you a question. Who should uh, add this capability to that component? Should it be uh, the developer from the team that needs to uh, have this capability? Or should we have some kind of dedicated components developer that he is a specialist that knows how to add this capability to the component? Now let's try to ask you that question. Who thinks the first option is correct? Uh, the developer in needs needs to add this capability. Raise your hand. Hey, that's, that's not a lot. Who thinks we need to have a special component developer to add this capability? All right. I was actually expecting the other way around, but I will go with the flow. So uh, basically, what I'm trying to say both options are really, really bad, or not really bad, really costly, and we're going to impose you unreasonable uh, kind of effort from your organization. Let's, uh, let's just investigate the first one, for example. Let's say that now uh, all of your developers need to be able to contribute to that library. This means that while they're developing their features, they need to stop, clone a new repository, uh, learn the te tech stack of that repository. They will need to um, learn how it's been uh, developed in terms of a design pattern. They will need to wait for QA and for merge requests from external people. They will need to make it uh, merge into the code, release it, and eventually can start working again. But if you go the other way around of uh, having some kind of a component steam, you suddenly created a massive bottleneck on all of your development lifecycle because now maybe two or three teams can be supporting by this extra team. But if you have 20 teams, you basically just created a very big dependency between your teams, which defeats the whole purpose of having micro fronts and front ends to begin with. So like I said before, both options are very costly. And you really need to uh, consider the trade-offs between the two of them according to your business needs and uh, the way you need to deliver code to your customers. Side effect number two, you still have a single point of failure. So like we saw before, uh, going into the microservices kind of patterns, we wanted to reduce uh, the way our uh, imposing risk to our app. Uh, by doing so, we broke it to different pieces, and now if one piece breaks, it doesn't necessarily mean that your whole app is going down. Now, because we said before, all of those pieces need to come together in the browser, uh, it's really hard to eliminate those, this single point of failure in your code. For example, you're probably going to have some kind of an application wrapper that holds all of those pieces together, maybe manage a global state, uh, have a component library that uh, a, lot of component, a lot of products are using. And in general, each type of implementation will pose a different risk level, but you will need to uh, negotiate among them. Let's see an example from our product. This is our main dashboard overview. Uh, we have many of those. We actually have uh, 30 different products using the same infrastructure for uh, uh, having like a suite of products under the infrastructure of micro frontends in our company. Now, if I eliminate the content on this certain page, we see that we still have some kind of a thin application layer that manages uh, a global application state, shows some components that we really need to show at all time. And in this case, they really have to be consistent because I cannot change it in one product and serve a different one on the other. 
if I will do that and impose a risk in one of those pieces of code, again, my whole app can, uh, can crash and go down, which is not what I, what I was aiming for. Side effect number three. So you just created in your company islands of knowledge. You have many teams. Each one of them is working on a different code base. He's not really exposed to what other teams are doing at the same time. Uh, the same implementation is going to happen again and again and again. It's very pricey for the organization. And in basically, I'm not just talking about components. Let's see a small example of uh, a form validation. You have many of them, probably in many products. Uh, it's a very simple problem to solve. But again, do you really want it to be solved over and over in different ways, in different products? So to tackle that, you have a lot of uh, technological solutions that can help you. You can use a storybook. It's pretty much a must these days, or something similar to expose the component library that you're using. This way, the developers can be familiar with it, the product uh, can be familiar with it, and even, uh, obviously, UX and UI that control it. Uh, you will need to add a lot of documentation, which takes a lot of time as well, and readme files. This way, uh, your utilities and services are managed in a self-service way. And even some companies uh, added a monorepo into their code base. And this way, all the developers have all the code from all the products. This way, it's easier to see how shared code is being used. And they really can uh, teach or learn from each other about common practices. But all of the above is not really enough. We already identified that a key feature here is the human factor. And at AppsFlyer, for example, we noticed that to bridge the gap between teams, we really had to start to operate uh, as a front-end guild. We started to, active, uh, to do uh, front-end forums uh, each week. On those forums, we discussed uh, the common uh, solutions for common problems. We decided together about our tech stack, what is mandatory and what is optional. We raised difficulties and all kinds of uh, things that we couldn't just do before, and we had to invest in the human aspects of it. More than that, we discovered that we are actually building a community and not a team. And this really imposed us to move all of our shared code from uh, being owned by one, simple uh, one single team to the whole front-end guild. And now, uh, we're really emphasizing to the developers that this code is, belongs to all of them and not a certain team that maintains it. And as a bonus, we gain uh, the capabilities that now developers are re code reviewing code from uh, developers from other team, and now they're bridging the gap of knowledge as well. So uh, taking back to uh, summarizing it all, I raised a lot of friction levels in the organization aspect. And I'm not complaining about them. If you're handling this type of uh, friction points, probably it's a good sign. It's a sign that your company is heading the right direction. It's evolving. Uh, and these challenges are good, and you need to tackle them. But if you will neglect them, neglect them, sorry, so it probably means that uh, it's going to fail your whole product before a bug or a bad implementation decision. So is it a silver bullet? Well, it is sometimes. I, I rather call it a really powerful tool. And as such, it's very important that you notice that you need to use it when the time is right. My own suggestion is start small. Uh, don't go uh, from the beginning, especially if you don't have a lot of experience with that in your own company. Uh, even a simple separation of your code base into different modules uh, really can take you a, a long way. And only when you see that uh, you hit uh, uh, some kind of limitation with that solution, take it to the next level. Remember, it's not only JavaScript tricks that will get you along. You will need to get your organization behind it. You will need to make hard decisions uh, around the structure and the way you operate. And in general, if I'm going to conclude, remember, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's going to take you a long time, and it's not ending anytime soon. So you better get in shape. Thank you very much.